And we go. Welcome everyone. This is Eric Pennington with the Spirit of EQ. Welcome to our video cast. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Mickey Leibowitz. Hi, Mickey. How are you? Good, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. You're a good man for doing so. Uh, well, it's 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 my pleasure, man. I'm I'm glad we were able to get this on the calendar. I've uh, been real excited to talk to you about some things relating to to healthcare, to medicine, but certainly some of the things that you're up to in trying to make sense of something that, and I know we've talked before, that sometimes it seems like our healthcare system makes no sense at all. But having said that, um, Mickey, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your background? Obviously, I know you're a physician, but maybe a little bit about uh, you know where you started and kind of your pathway to where you're at today, and then we'll, we'll get into some things that I selfishly want to talk to you about. Okay, great. Well, so you're right. I am a physician. I have a specialty in endocrinology, which is uh, taking care of uh, diseases that affect the glands, like uh, thyroid gland and pituitary gland, diabetes, a lot of diabetes. Yep. And I was in private practice for about 17 years, and um, back, back in around 2007, I, for a variety of reasons, which I wrote about in my book, Samelish Plug, uh, Losing My okay. Patients, which I wrote back in 2007, I left private practice, and then I've been on a really cool journey ever since. I was a couple of years at the VA hospital serving the veterans, which was really important to me because I never served in the military. I did that for a couple of years. And then um, afterwards, I was invited to become... Uh, a quality director at a local hospital, which was really a cool opportunity because it gave me, an, uh, gave me a chance to put in place systems to help groups of people as opposed to just taking care of individuals. And our goal was to try to make the hospital more efficient, more effective, more cost effective, and to put in uh, place a lot of the uh, initiatives that the va uh, value-based purchasing, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act has to do. And then a couple of years ago, I said, you know, I achieved everything I really wanted to achieve. And I went on another little journey, which took me to learn more about emotional intelligence, because I really think that that's going to be, that's really the fundamental foundational way that doctors can really take best care of their patients. And in the end, it really comes down to taking care of patients. So that's a really quick history of my journey to be where I am today. Well, you know what, Mickey? I know when we first met, um, you you had mentioned this thing, um, and, and we'll get into it uh, here in a bit about bringing harmony to healthcare. And when you unwrapped that for me about what you wanted to do, and then I kind of looked at your history, I'm going, I think I have found somebody who's in my tribe. He wants to take on something really, really big. You know, he's not afraid to shy away from something that, quite frankly, is it, it, on the face of it. For some people out there, it might go, that's pretty daunting. You walked away from a practice. You've been in practice for 17 years, and then you did this and that. Um, so maybe that's a good launching point. Um, Want to talk about what were some of the reasons why you decided to, to walk away, right? Um, and then maybe talk about some of the things that were happening inside of you personally that were driving it. So maybe talk about the external. What were the, some of the external things that were happening that kind of led you down? Right. That yeah, I appreciate it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a harmony guy. I've been this way, you know, ever since I've been knee high and uh, Ant and I got no alibi and <laughs> cannot lie. The thing is, you know, being, I thought, I thought going into medicine would be a really harmony thing. It was going to fit my personality. I'd be able to uh, take care of people. They'd be grateful. The system would be grateful. Everybody would be happy. People would be getting well. And what I found out uh, soon after this is it really wasn't a harmony field at all. There was a mm -hmm. lot of greed, a lot of competition. Uh, payers were putting extra pressures on us. Pharmaceutical companies were putting problems. Uh, problems throughout giving out problems to our patients they couldn't afford their medications there was always the threat of malpractice there was increasing uh, regulations and uh, back in 2007 I was an employed physician in a family practice group mm -hmm. and uh, seeing more patients than ever generating more revenue than ever but the group didn't think it was enough and so they gave me a choice I could either see more patients and make the same amount of money or uh, or make less money the same number of pay. I just I just couldn't do more, more 
Mm -hmm. And I looked at the future of Met. It wasn't really what I expected it to be. It wasn't that harmony that I was hoping for. There was all these external forces that were putting pressure on us and it was making me not be in the harmony that I wanted to be in. So I was left at a choice. I wrote about it again in my book called Losing My Patience, which is still available on Amazon.com. Shameless know. plug. That's and right. um, I wrote about it. And, you know, for me to write about something like that, a guy who really took, barely took an English class, you know, didn't know how to type, didn't, you know, didn't know how to write. Yeah. And, and I, but I was so impassioned about the whole thing and how it all played out that I, that I wrote about it in that book. And, um, and I thought maybe I would still continue to play for my team just on a different position on the field. So I'm mm -hmm. still very, very interested in great patient care. I'm really interested in helping our docs take really good care of their patients. I'm just trying to help them from a different position on the field, and that's where emotional intelligence comes into play. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, something was going through my head as you were talking, and I'm going, I'm trying to picture you being in that practice. You know, you got partners, um, there's the pressure about uh, the income and the revenue and all that stuff, and then dealing with the insurance companies. So uh, since you've kind of been out of that world, at least private practice, do you feel like there are like a significant number of doctors out there that maybe would say, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. I, I'm at the end of my rope. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that because uh, after the book came out and a lot of people read it, uh, a lot of my doctor friends would call me and say, I'm really glad you wrote that book because now I don't have to because it really captured all that they were feeling. And you might think now that, you know, it's 10 years later that things would have been better. In fact, it's the opposite. Things are worse for our docs. Uh, at least half the docs are burnt out and the other half, are, you know, the old joke is the other half just lie about it. The, wow. uh, the, the pressures have mounted even greater. Uh, docs in their primes, late 50s, early 60s have said, you know, they're counting the days till they can retire and get out of the field. You know, when people, uh, people's expectations aren't met, they become disappointed. And when they become disappointed, as soon as they can financially do it, they, they leave. Yeah, and it's a really sad fact because uh, there's already a shortage of physicians in particular areas like endocrinology. Uh, yeah, we have more people with diabetes now than ever. We call it the diabetes epidemic. And, uh, you know, it would be great if we had more endocrinologists, but there's a lot, a lot of docs who want to do endocrinology and a lot of docs are leaving uh, and not a lot of docs are, are following up. So there's a really big shortage, you know, in, in our future and starting now even. So, you know, you mentioned emotional intelligence. Um, and, and I know in the work that we do, I, I kind of boil it down to it's, you know, the, uh, the definition of the balancing of thought and emotion to make optimal decisions, right? Um, so if the doctor out there is feeling like they're burnt out, um, and maybe I'm kind of being uh, rhetorical here because I know I've talked to you about this before, but is emotional intelligence maybe a tool to, to help them manage the, the process? I know it maybe is not the silver bullet. It's not going to fix the healthcare system per se, but would it help? Well, you know, in life, there's the old serenity prayer, which I say all day, every day. What can I control? What can't I control to know mm -hmm. the difference? Yeah. So what I hope for with EQ is that I can't, I'm not going to make the pharmaceutical companies lower their prices. I'm not going to have the government reduce the regulations, mm -hmm. et cetera. But one of the things I could help docs do is to manage it better yeah. and uh, to be able to recognize when they're feeling amped up or agitated uh, to uh, understand what situations cause them to feel that way and then to recognize it so that they don't uh, uh, blow up and react rather than, uh, rather than respond and see if they can't really quiet their nervous system down so that they are, you know, we talk about this concept called the zone. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is to, and it's a very easy visual. It's two parallel lines. And if you're within those lines, then you're in your zone. And you might fluctuate within that, within those two parallel lines. The key is to try to widen that zone as much as possible. Uh, and, and, uh, and then if you recognize the things that will bump you out of the zone and then recognize the things that could get you back in your zone. Mm -hmm. so we talk, when I work with our docs, uh, I talk to them a lot about this visual, the zone. 
ask him to be re reflective, what widens your zone, what narrows your zone, what bumps you out of your zone, what strategies can you use to get back in your zone so that maybe they can um, navigate the system better and, and, um, and have some duration, durability to their practice. And also, you know, when you're ramped up and agitated, the, the likelihood of making mistakes is even greater. And again, it all comes back to, to patience. Yeah, that's a great point, um, uh, Mickey. The um, the process that you know I think about um, again what they're they're dealing with, and I'm I'm going to try to paint this picture up to to the point where you were at. That I mean, I think about a doctor, the amount of schooling and the amount of knowledge ultimately you have to have to be able to be a quote good physician, right? And I think about you know at least in the worlds that I walk in, you know, the, there's a and maybe it's a stereotype. The doctors have a pretty large ego. They they're not real keen to being, you know, maybe told something different than what they they know. And I, I know that's probably pretty worn out, and it probably does land in the stereotype. But do you find that doctors that you work with or that you maybe first encounter are they open to getting the kind of help that EQ can give? Well, so you know, doctors come in all shapes and sizes with different backgrounds and. Some are more receptive than others. Uh, so I've coached quite a few docs. And they come in, some docs just want to get better. They're, they're in a good spot. They just want to even be better than they are. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to enhance their capabilities. Yep. Some docs are sent my way because they're disruptive. And they've done things that they shouldn't have done, said things that they shouldn't have said, and then uh, the physicians police themselves and they go through these peer review committees mm -hmm. and sometimes docs will go through those committees and then uh, to help them get better so that they don't repeat what they've done before. Yeah. They, 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 they might come to me and uh, I could help work with them to figure out like what happened, what were you feeling, what were you thinking um, and how could you do it better? So it's really a coaching strategy. So guy, again, some docs just want to get better. They're in a good spot, but some docs really mm -hmm. need, need the help. You know, and just to add to that, uh, I've been working with a malpractice insurance company. And, mm -hmm. uh, and although I haven't really formalized any workings together, I presented the, the concept of, try, of, of asking doctors to learn about EQ be, even before they've had any malpractice claims. Because again, I think if they're in their zone, they're less likely to make mistakes. And right. then, or alternatively, to work with docs who've had more than a couple of malpractice suits to see if there's something going on there that we might be able to uh, understand so that they don't repeat their mistakes going forward. So is, is that almost like a, the insurance company maybe looking to mitigate the risk a bit? Uh, yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so exactly. So the, the intent would be, you know, right now doctors are given like a small little discount, like a 5% discount on the malpractice uh, premiums mm -hmm. if they take an eight hour course. And the docs complain about it because it's, you know, they go, oh, why am I doing this? Of course. Yeah. But they, um, but I was, I was thinking that maybe we could add it onto the front side and have yeah. docs do an assessment have an hour of coaching, maybe follow up, maybe some presentations, because what they're teaching in the malpractice review courses are the technical side of reducing malpractice, how to document, how to time your notes, things like that. Yeah. But when I'm at, I'm, I think medicine is tech and touch, and I don't think we spend enough time on the touch side, and that's what I'm suggesting we offer them. It's, it's a new way to think about it, because you know doctors are always rewarded on the technical things, but I think that we don't pay enough attention to the touch side. That's where I like to, I think there's opportunity there. That's really, really great. Um, so, you know, Mickey, uh, as we're kind of on this point about what doctors are dealing with and what they're doing uh, and how they're managing, um, what are a couple of things would you say if someone in our audience is kind of like, well, I, I think I know what my doctor is all about. I know how he operates and blah, blah, blah. Is there, what would be something you would say Hey, this is what your doctor would really like you to to know. If 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 all things being equal, you're out at a bar somewhere having a beer, or if you were at a an event or something, what would a doctor maybe would want someone to know that maybe they don't about them? 
Well, I like, I like to think that the doctors um, would really want their patients to know that they really care about them, that they've worked really, really hard and sacrificed a real lot to get where they are. Uh, I, I even now I look back and I just can't believe I did it. You know, it was 15 years until I went into practice. It was undergrad, there was medical school, there was internship and residency and chief residency and fellowships. And you know, I didn't get my first real job until I was like 33 years old. So it was enormous sacrifice to ourselves uh, and to our families. You know, we gave up a lot of time, although I always try to fit the time in for sure yeah. and balance things. Uh, we're under enormous amounts of pressures uh, to do the, you know, to do the right thing. We, we, we know we can't be perfect, but, uh, you know, we can't, there's no room for errors. You can't say, Hey, you know, I, you know, I'm going to make an error once in a while. I guess it's going to be on you. You know, of course, you know, nobody wants that. So right. we're trying to make perfect decisions with imperfect information. Yeah. And, um, and we're trying to be fresh for each person. So if we see 20 or 25 people in a day, even if it's the same condition, we try to remain fresh and, uh, and, you know, really focused on that particular person each and every visit to make sure that the person knows that they, we really care about them. But it is emotionally and physically draining, draining to do. Yeah. And that said, I yeah. think a lot of us really, really want to, what keeps a lot of the docs in practice, even though a lot of them are on the verge of, of uh, burnout, is, is the deep satisfaction they get from helping people. Sounds cliche, but it's true. Yeah. Wow. That's really powerful. Um, well, I think it's probably time that we shift a little bit maybe and talk about the patient, right? Sure. Um, I, I am, um, I am a, a type one diabetic, which you know, yep. uh, and I've had the disease for probably close to 30 years or so, maybe a little north of that. And um, my physician group is based at uh, the Ohio State University, right? So it's kind of that blend of having the true practice plus they have the research side that kind of comes along. And I'll never forget the one thing that was different about them is that they were really into this idea that my care was a partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, that it was, I was the manager. They were almost kind of like the consultant. You know, here's what we've seen, here's what we've done, here's some history, here's some research, and you got to make a decision here. Mm -hmm. And I loved that, but it was almost kind of contrary, Mickey, because the culture didn't seem to be going down that path. I mean, because a lot of times it seemed like, you know, as patients, we were just going in and say, okay, doc, I got this issue. What do I do here? Take this, take this prescription, have this procedure done or whatever. And uh, I've always been a big believer that it is a partnership. Um, I can't come to you or to my doctor and be a bad manager of my health and expect that somehow you're going to pull something out of your coat pocket. That's just going to fix it. Mm -hmm. um so do you find from as the years you've been in medicine has that kind of gotten better are patients being more are they more aware more committed to their health or or do you find it's kind of tracking the same way it is from the physician perspective meaning you know 10 years going forward it's not it's not getting any better that kind of thing yeah so you bring up a lot of very interesting uh, uh points there uh, as a physician, uh, and, and I talk a lot, I'm, I'm one, one of my positions now is I'm the medical director of the physician assistant program at, at one of the local colleges, Lemoyne College here in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And when I, I talk to the students, I, I tell them they have to be a chameleon. They have to be able to kind of change colors, meaning that they have to really understand what each individual patient needs. Mm -hmm. now, some people really need to say, Mrs. Jones, I need you at six o'clock every morning to take this medication, be very prescriptive. Yeah. For other patients, I, not, I might need to be, to use a sports metaphor, I might need to be the coach where the person, the, the patient, if you will, the person is the player. So I could shout directions, you know, do this, you know, do that. But in the end, um, the patient has to really need to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I have to figure out what motivates them to do it. And this is really, really EQ comes in because in order to understand others, how they think and feel, the mm -hmm. physician has to understand how they think and feel. Yeah. So if I understand me, I could better understand you. The other thing I like about EQ and patient care is if I can understand how I think and feel and I could recognize it in you, then I could adjust 
what I think and what I say and my behaviors so that I could develop a relationship with you. Yeah. And if there's a relationship, then hopefully it's built upon trust because I understand you, you understand me. And, uh, and I will tell you that patients for one, one person in particular said, doc, I think you care more about me than I care about me. <laughs> and I think that for him, I think it might've been true, but <laughs> the point is that we had developed a relationship. We had developed a trust and it was based upon a lot of EQ principles. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's where I was heading too, you know, Mickey. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things. Um, and I've, I've mentioned it to, um, to the university, you know, that it, sometimes, I mean, and when anybody has a chronic disease, I mean, it's a daily management thing. I mean, and, and, and it is driven by emotion and, and our thought. And, and, you know, EQ has certainly helped me personally in that regard. Um, making better decisions because you and I both know that, yeah, some of it is quote luck of the draw. Some people are very fortunate in managing a chronic disease. Other people are not. And sometimes it's not because one was better than the other. It's just, that's just how it happened. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think anybody should take it for granted, right? That, you know what, um, you, you got to make a decision here. You know, you, you, you've taken X amount of insulin for the X amount of carbs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like nine o'clock at night, maybe you should probably pass on that piece of whatever, right? right. Um, so let, let's look, look for a minute at, at this idea of what the patients are dealing with with the healthcare system. And, and maybe this is a good lead into talking about, um, and I loved your, your slogan about the harmony in healthcare. And, and it always makes me think of music. I, I just, I think of, I think of all these instruments, they make beautiful music in a symphony when they are playing together, right? Yep. So I know as, as a, uh, again, with a person with a chronic disease, I, I'm, I'm a consumer of healthcare on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, it is pretty maddening. Um, the hoops to jump through, the, um, you know, the having to call to check and see whether or not the insurance company, why they delayed the payment to hear that, well, we didn't get the prior authorization. And then I tell them, well, you told me when I called you six months ago that after I had the procedure done, I didn't need another prior authorization. Well, that's incorrect. You'll have to have your doctor call us. And, and I called it a month ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a great way of describing it because yeah, I try to wear you down. And right. So we're in that place, right? And I, I'm just one example, right? And I'm sure there's other that have probably even worse situations to deal with. Um, when you talk about harmony in healthcare, or, or, I mean, and it's such a big issue. I, I know, Mickey, that you're not telling me, yeah, Eric, I know how to fix that, what you just went through. But what's a small thing or a few small things that you think harmony in healthcare might do in improving the way that we, I guess, for lack of a better way to say, dispense care or manage the care? Yeah, so one of the things that really um, got my attention was when I was this quality director at the hospital I was working at, uh, I stepped out of my little bubble and I saw a, a much bigger picture because otherwise I was isolated in my, in my practice with a couple, three other docs. And uh, yeah, yeah. But what I saw at the hospital was that there was really a lot of uh, disharmony amongst uh, physicians and doctors and nurses and, and administration and doctors and, and the list goes on. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a book that was written that got my attention. It's entitled Patients Come Second. It's by uh, authors Barrett and Spiegelman. And you go, well, what does that mean, patients come second? Yeah. And the answer is that in order for people to get the best care possible, doctors either individually or in groups need to be in harmony mm. because if they're fighting there's bad community there's poor communication there's less discussion and less coordination of care and yeah. who suffers the patients so the patients really come second the harmony has to and it's it's a very edgy title which you know people can criticize yeah. but the point is that doctors need to be in harmony as individuals they need to be in harmony as group you know it's very Medicine is complex. So with you, with your uh, diabetes, and uh, I, I don't know, we could have a whole discussion about how hard it is to live with diabetes. And I'm so happy 
that you have navigated 30 years of diabetes. And you remember me telling you that if you ever had to have diabetes, the best, this is the best year to have it because every year is better than the last with, in terms, with regards yeah. to the treatment and the management and reducing complications and our understanding. So, but it's really hard. It's really hard for docs to help manage people with diabetes and chronic conditions unless they're in harmony themselves and could transmit that harmony to other docs, to the nurses. You know, we can't take care of people's conditions by ourselves. It, medicine has gotten way too complicated. So for as example, with diabetes, I'm gonna need the expertise of an ophthalmologist, of a, of a eye doctor, of a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, of a neuro, uh, neurologist, uh, of a, uh, a heart, of a cardiologist. You know, so we all need to work together. And if we're not in harmony, we can't talk to each other. We, we don't want to call that dot because they're bullies or because they're arrogant. Then, then who who suffers? Yeah, it's going to be the patient. It's going to, it's be, the going to patient. be the patient. So I think it all is connected, uh, and it comes back to something that's fundamental, which I think is the emotional intelligence. Yeah. So um, obviously, one small step at a time. Uh, I, I, you know, it'd be great if you did have a silver bullet to fix it, because Lord knows, uh, you know. Some of the things that, uh, and I, I just happen to be in that place, right? Um, well, yeah, so you asked the question before about, you know, Doc's willingness to uh, to participate in this whole emotional trans yeah, uh, yeah. intelligence, and it comes down to the old joke: How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So it comes down to the Docs: Are they are they interested? Are they interested in doing this or not? And you know, what I, what I like to do is to give them the opportunity to at least learn about it. I gave a talk not, not long ago to a group of about 40 docs. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I'm interested. I'm, I'd be very willing to offer you the opportunity to do an emotional intelligence assessment. And I'll, I'll do it for free. I'll coach you for free. So about 20% of the docs said, I'll do it, which was more than I thought would do it. I thought, mm -hmm. I thought that once they heard about emotional intelligence, they might all get up and walk away. Not only did they not walk away, but they, they stayed and their uh, feedback was very positive and, and eight of the docs decided to just even have an emotional intelligence assessment and have a coaching session, which I was really... Uh, Do you think the key happy. component there, uh, Mickey, was the humility? Well, for the docs who signed up? Yeah. I think that uh, it does take a certain amount of humility uh, to do so because you open yourself up. I mean, it takes some courage to yes. really, uh, to really self-assess, you know, how am I doing it? I, I've also coached uh, quite a few uh, leaders, both in healthcare and, and non-healthcare job, uh, and not in healthcare uh, areas. Yeah. And we do this uh, leadership 360 review mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of courage. You know, you put yourself out there, you're not sure what's coming back. Yeah. It could be good and it could be not so good. Yeah. But if you really want to get better and you want to be the best that you could be and to reach your full potential, you got to know, you got to reflect on you and you have to hear what others think of you because you might think that you're the greatest and others might not perceive it that way. And if there's a gap, mm -hmm. where is the gap? Why is it there? And what can you do about it? So it does take a lot of courage and a lot of uh, yeah, courage, I think, is, is, is the right word. Courage. Yeah. So um, just maybe a cultural question, because it, it kind of has me, it's ringing around in my head. Are, are most physicians, have you found, are they, uh, when they meet other physicians, whether it's in their specialty or, or what have you, are they pretty um, agreeable? Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Do they find themselves to be welcoming to the other physicians? Or is it more adversarial, uh, kind of that well, you know, he may be a, you know, so-and-so at such-and-such, but I am a so-and-so at a such-and-such. Or I, I guess I wonder, is there that camaraderie or is it more adver adversarial in your experience? Yeah, so, you know, again, it takes all, t it's all there's all types of medicine, but I, I will tell you to get into medical school and then to survive medical school and to su survive all the training, it's uh, intensely competitive. Mm -hmm. and I think that for, for, for one to succeed, and to navigate that system and to come out on the, on the, on the other side takes enormous amounts of competitive spirit, not only with yourself, but sometimes with others. You like to think that as we grow and mature, 
that the, uh, I forget who said it, I think it might've been Winston Churchill. I think it was Winston Churchill, if not maybe Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but he said, once competition fails, collaboration takes over. And what I like to think is that uh, as we mature as physicians, it's not who's better, but can we work together yeah. for the best outcome for individual patients? And I, I think that, you know, depending upon individual docs, some might have gotten to that level and some might still be in that competitive phase. Right. And, and we know that emotional intelligence is, is one of, um, I would say, a, a, not a large number of tools, but it's certainly one of the key ones out there to, to help uh, improve uh, what we have, whether it's on the physician side or patient side. Um, well, the one thing, Eric, that I really like about the emotional intelligence is doctors respond to three things. Hmm. Number one, they, they like to hear from people they find credible, typically somebody in their tribe, like another physician, and maybe mm -hmm. even somebody who's like a surgeon to a surgeon or an endocrinologist to an endocrinologist, but certainly somebody who's credible and they tend to think that other physicians might be credible. The yeah. second thing that they like is that they like data. And the one thing I like about the EQ is the assessments we could do. Yes. And then show them on paper with a number, especially if it's comparative, you know, to other, to other group, other cohorts, or other groups of people to yep. show what their number is compared to others. They respond very well to that. And the last thing to respond to is what's in it for me. And they really like to say, well, what's in it for me here is if I know more about myself, I could be better. And those are the things that I think uh, is nice about the EQ as opposed to just, you know, uh, tell me about yourself. How can I help you get better? I, with EQ, especially with the assessment, you have definitive numbers that paint, uh, that uh, show or tell a very specific uh, story about them. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that's a great point. Uh, the... The one thing in doing the work that we're doing in emotional intelligence, um, though not specific to uh, physicians, and I know we've talked about this before, it is just that, is that we start with data, that, that, and this is valid. This has got a lot of validity to it. Yeah. And we can pinpoint and we can measure. Then we can start talking about, do we need to go left? Do we need to go right? Do we need to... Do we need to back off? Do we need to go full force? Because otherwise, if you don't do that, then I think it has to be based on some level of assumption, right? Mm -hmm. Some level of uh, maybe gut. And, and those things aren't necessarily bad unto themselves, but I know for a fact that, especially as long as I've been in this world, um, doing this kind of work, we're in it because we want to help people to get yep. to a breakthrough. And there's no sense in me traveling down a mysterious road that we really don't know where it's taken us. Uh -huh. I mean, it might feel good in the moment, but in the end, it's got to deliver. I mean, it, it needs to deliver. Um, so what are you kind of thinking in terms of the, the two as they meet and partner, right? The patient and the physician. Um, because part of me, as I'm listening to you, um, it's like there's no denying the, the data, right? There's no getting around the things that you've talked about, right? And, and, and even if we said 10% of it is your opinion and my opinion, that means you still got 90% of it, right? <laughs> is, yeah. is based on fact. Um, so sometimes I'm thinking, or I guess what I'm thinking is is, is, is it a matter of that repetition of message and where that message comes from? Is it the hospital groups? the administration inside of the hospital, the, the, the messaging that's happening within the hospital systems that needs to start valuing this idea of leveraging emotional intelligence for these better outcomes? Or is it from physicians associations? Or do you have any sense about that? Well, yeah, I, I, um, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, it comes from both. It comes from the hospital and it comes from physician groups. And I'll tell you why. Uh, with the Affordable Care Act, which some people call Obamacare, yeah. other people call it Obama doesn't care. It depends on your political persuasion. Right. But the bottom line is right now uh, that docs are going to get paid for outcomes. 
So, and the outcomes are gonna be publicly reported. So in the old days, um, how did you know that the doctor was a good doctor? I liked him, you know, he was a good guy, she was a good guy. Mm -hmm. But now, talking about, let's say diabetes, uh, there's gonna be outcomes data that's gonna be publicly reported and graded such that you will know which hospital takes care of people with diabetes better than other hospitals who take care of people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the better you take care of them and the scores, and if the scores are higher, you'll get paid more from the payers for quality of care. And the payers being the insurance companies. The insurance companies, well, really it's, me, it's a Medicare driven system right now, but right. usually uh, private insurers follow Medicare. Okay. So they'll look, they'll look at readmission rates, they'll look at length of stay, they'll look at mortality rates, they'll look at complication rates. Mm -hmm. And that's on the hospital side. On the outpatient side, it's the same thing. There's all this public reporting uh, that needs to be done that will say that this group of doctors is achieving a high level of quality care than another group and uh, will, they'll get paid a higher rate than the other docs who are not delivering such high quality care. So yeah. again, it comes back to the EQ. If, I'm, if my zone is narrow, um, I get bumped out easily, I'm agitated easily, um, I get angry, I, I, I can't focus well on the, on the care of the patient, then my quality, quality outcome scores will be lower, I'll get paid less, and if I'm in a group, the group's gonna say, hey, Leibowitz, man, what's going on with you? You're, you're, you're bringing the group down. So um, again, you know, docs, I said docs are competitive. We're not really competitive, we just like winning. Uh, but right. the fact is that we like to win and we like to do well, not only because it's good for our patients, but in the end, uh, since medicine is a business, you'll get paid for the good quality care that you were delivering. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it you know, the that data. That gives me an idea. Yeah, yeah, because I think the, those, are, those are kind of uh, levers, if you will, of accountability, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't say that, or I, I don't bring it up because I think, well, we need to get these doctors in line and they need to do better. Uh, because quite frankly, I, and I've been sort of the, you know, my own in my head champion for why should I pay the same rate for my insurance if I'm exercising six times a week, I'm keeping my weight at a constant, my A1C is X. If I'm working my butt off to manage this, why should I have to pay the same rate as the guy that decides, hey, I'm just gonna sit on the couch every night of the week, watch TV and drink beer. Right. Um, and I think that that process of, uh, incentivizing the patient, right? And I know some employers, you know, if your BMI is, you know, above X, then you've got to pay a little bit more than the person whose BMI index is, you know, lower. I get some of that. Um, and, and the craziness in that too, Mickey, is that, um, and then this is where I think emotional intelligence has so much power, is that mm -hmm. when you think about the emotions and managing them with, with, with our thoughts, we all have got to agree that this is stuff that, I mean, I should be motivated to manage my health. Right. I, you know, a doctor should be, in, uh, he should be wanting to, hey, I want to make sure that my outcomes are the best possible. I don't want to be agitated. Agitation is going to hurt me. Absolutely. You know, one of the things we're doing uh, uh, in, at the college where I'm uh, the medical director at is we are doing a study looking at the emotional intelligence of people with diabetes and comparing it to the glucose, the sugar control. Oh my. And the hypothesis is that if you have higher emotional intelligence, that you'll be more self-aware, be able to self-manage better. And as you know, personally, diabetes is all about self-management. So the hypothesis is that if your EQ is higher, your glycemic control, your blood sugar control will be better. And we'll wow. see there's one study from University of Chicago from a few years ago that suggested that's true. We're going to look at that again. Uh, that's now really powerful. That's really, really powerful. And I would dare say, right, I mean, if you look at other chronic diseases, mm -hmm. um, you know, potentially, I mean, the application, I think, is across the board. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm firm in my belief, Mickey, that 
it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a, Hey, if, if we could just as a patient, right. If we could just get the doctors to be more harmonious. Hey, if we could just get the hospitals to do a better job at their scores and, you know, admittance rates and whatever, it, it's a shared thing around. It's a, a whole wheel here. Right. And yeah. I think, um, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I know people don't wake up in the morning and think, man, I really want to make some bad decisions today. Right. Right. No, no doctor wants to get up and say, you know what? I really want to be agitated today. Yeah. Um, but I think all of us would agree when we get up in the morning, I get hit with five things. You get hit with 10. Then other doctor gets hit with two, how we end that day up, what news we get. I mean, all the dynamics at play, it, it kind of conspires, right? Yeah. Um, well, we, th we say it's not, it's not, it's not if you get bumped out of your zone, it's when you get bumped out of your zone. Yeah, it's, that's a great way of saying it. You're, you're going to get triggered during your day, but you know, your character, which is how you manage yourself is, is really based upon your uh, ability to uh, be self-aware, recognize patterns. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so that's self-awareness. It's then based upon that, the self-management. And then the, the most important piece is that your self-direction. You, what's your North Star? And are you making decisions in alignment with your North Star? So mm -hmm. if your North Star as a physician is to take really good care of your patients, uh, then what do I need to do to do that? And, and again, we're offering uh, this uh, emotional intelligence assessments and coaching to help doctors understand what their self, uh, self, uh, their North star is, their self direction and how to get there and how to maintain that focus. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. That's powerful. You know, and, uh, Mickey, as we get close to the end of our time together and I tell you what, I, th I think we could go for a bit longer, but I, oh, I, yeah, I it's always, a, it's always a treat talking to you, Eric, man. Well, I, 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 it's, it's, it's mutual. Yeah, it's mutual. And, um, so last thing, and I typically like to do this, uh, with anybody who's a guest, um, who or what is inspiring you right now? Well, who inspires me? Uh, somebody asked me this question not long ago. And uh, uh, the person I came up with was uh, MLK, Martin Luther King. He, he inspires me because he's a person who had an idea um, and acted on it in a way that I thought was uh, uh, transformational. I, yeah. I just thought that, and, and he had... You know, he had the courage, he had the grit, the persistence and passion to do something. And so guys like that inspire me a lot. I mean, ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, you and I could have had this idea about EQ and how we're going to use EQ to bring harmony to the world. And Lord knows we need it, um, you know, to, to bring group individuals together, groups of people together, countries together. So we could have just said, that's a good idea. And then what about our day and not pursuing it? But guys like Martin Luther King, guys like you, Eric, and a lot of the people we've met on our EQ journey, we've taken this idea and we said, you know, we're really, we really want to do something about it and, uh, and, and bring a little extra harmony to the world, man. It, it just yeah, really needs it. It's that's so, really good. And you know what? Um, I, it, it never fails that the people that I have met um, in this, as you describe it, the EQ journey, is how many of them are pursuing things that are really bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's really, really inspiring. And um, so your points along that line, Mickey, just off the charts. So uh, I want to thank you. I really appreciate well, you coming on. Time, Eric. Yeah, 